Good evening, everybody, and welcome back to the Thursday evening session of the 2021 NOFA Summer Conference. My name is Paul, and I will be the host for this evening's workshop. Before we begin, I have a few announcements to make. I uh, hope you've been enjoying our, our summer conference virtually this year. Um, one advantage is that we can have these evening sessions throughout the week, um, spread out the learning, not just over the weekend. Uh, obviously, we hope uh, this coming winter to have our winter conferences in person. Uh, but I do think that the virtual format has some, some lasting benefits. And I think even as we go forward with in-person conferences, our goal is to be able to record the workshops so that people can again have the convenience of, of learning at your own time and in your own comfort. So uh, stay tuned for that. We are presenting, attending, and hosting this workshop from land that was inhabited before European colonization. Please take a, mom a moment to honor those whose land you now occupy. Much of what we know about how to grow food and manage land regeneratively came from farmers of color. NOFA invites you to consider how to incorporate racial equity in your own work. If you're not familiar with Zoom, uh, we have a couple reminders here. Uh, your account will be set to mute um, at the end of the presentation. Uh, there will be a time for questions and answers, so you're welcome to unmute yourself and uh, speak up and then mute when you're done for, for clarity for everyone. Um, as a reminder, the chat feature is available, so throughout the presentation, if at any point anything's unclear or you have a question, uh, feel free to pop it in the chat. And then again, at the end of the presentation, we'll address those questions and make sure we get an answer for you. And again, this session is being recorded. Just take a quick moment to thank our sponsors. Without the support of our sponsors, we would not be able to have a successful summer conference. Many of our sponsors have been around for, for many years and have had a long-term support of NOFA. And a few have uh, some new sponsors as well. So. I'm sure they, many of these folks have things you might need for your home or your farm. And we hope when you're considering who to support that you know, their support of NOFA and our work is important to you and you give them some, some consideration. We do have our online auction going. Lots of things have been bidding. Um, it, the auction will go through the last session tomorrow. So we've got about 24 more hours to uh, get your bids in. And finally, uh, our online virtual vendor marketplace. Feel free to check out the program book for uh, videos and links to all of our different virtual vendors. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dave Schmidt for standalone solar powered drip irrigation systems. Uh, Dave was a gardener turned hobby farmer turned actual farmer, and he's now at Oxcart Farm uh, in Upton, Massachusetts. And Dave has about 15 years of experience with energy and sustainability. Uh, this is not Dave's first conference presentation, but it's been a few years. So let's welcome Dave back, and we look forward to hearing from you tonight. Thank you, and welcome everyone. Good evening, just gonna share my screen here. Did throw on a headset just want to check in to make sure that i'm audible audio sounds good fantastic great okay i have a lot of images here not many words and um this is what i'm going to go through pretty quickly but um, maybe just in the chat uh, or if there's some feature today that I need or something. and dave Yes. Pardon me for, sorry for interrupting, but I just, I do want to let our, our particip participants know that Dave has shared these slides in the, um, the Google Drive, which we'll put a link to in the chat shortly. Uh, but if you want to follow along or just know as far as for your own note taking purposes that you do have access to these slides after the fact. So thank you for that, Dave. Go ahead. Great. Yeah, sure thing. Yep. And, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. I'm just going to um, move around. First, let me say that this is I presented this before um, and was invited to present again to showcase what things look like after four years. And I say that they pretty much look the same, but um, 
and I'll have a few uh, updates along the way. So here's a general outline. Um, I'm just gonna launch right into it because uh, we'll get into a bunch of those different things. A little disclaimer, which essentially boils down to, hey, electricity is dangerous and so are some of the things that can be <laughs> carried by water. So if you are going to attempt any of these things, make sure um, you do a little more research than what's presented here. This is not a, a thorough or exhaustive um, presentation on, on how to do these things or how to do them safely. Um, so what I made a number of years ago, uh, seven years ago, was essentially a box that kept things mostly dry and mostly cool. It was uh, just from some lumber laying around, some heart pine from a fence, and some white oak logs, and just a really rustic setup, some two by fours, um, and slapped together uh, with some care and some measure um, to, again, allow water to be shed off of it and air to move through. And I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that later. Uh, and then, you know, there was a design and then there's sort of adding things as you go, <laughs> fixing things as you go. What is a great material to use? Because you can make those corrections and modifications as you spin through. This is the front cover here. Again, just keeping those boards together, but those, those pieces running horizontally are, uh, will be useful, you'll see, to keep the front door propped up. Um, Again, and now I've shown a solar panel on top. So this is this is the little box that contains everything. Plenty of space for air to move through. Solar panels are most efficient when they're not overheating. So I have a lot of air space underneath it. And here's a close up on how that door just sort of meshes with everything else. You'll come up with your own design, of course. Um, but effectively what you're looking for is a basic box and easy entry. So these things are just fastened on with some screws. The solar system, but you could think of this as the brain of the solar system. This is called a charge controller. There are many brands out there. This happened to be one that came in a kit, was reasonably priced, and came from a large box store. Um, but essentially, it's, it's, it's controlling the amount of power or electricity that comes from the solar panel and is delivered to your battery or to your load, being your pumps in this case. And you see how they all interconnect down there at the bottom of this thing. This is device two that also benefits from air circulation so that it doesn't overheat. So I've just raised it up off this little piece of wood here. And my goal in putting this together was to have components that were kind of plug and play and can be just screwed into the, the pump house and taken out for the winter. Um, so there's some flexibility and ease in making changements, but again, winterizing things. Um, I'll say a little more on that later too. But here I'm showing, um, just putting it right in there, somewhere central, somewhere handy. Um, I'm showing now the battery that's in place. And in terms of connecting this up to the system, your first step would be connect a battery up to your charge controller. You would never want to connect solar panels first. And here I'm showing you the positive lead being connected. You'll want to make sure that your crimps on those wires are very secure. I'm just using old automotive wire um, this is a place where if that was a loose connection between the wire and that aluminum crimp, if it's, if it's loose, it, it, could, it could potentially be a fire hazard. Um, with a system this small, it's not a, a huge deal, but um, it, you want your, all of your connections to be quite secure. Yeah, it's paramount to, to, for safety. And now on the charge controller, there's a little green light in the middle of those three um, showing that the battery is connected and registered. Um, this is what uh, a handy little system I use to mount it uh, to the wood frame. This is just a, an EMT clamp, a pretty common um, fastener for electrical metallic tubing that's used for electric work. And this is what I'm going to use as my, essentially my top rail for the solar panel. And I've, I've marked out with little dots where the fasteners are. That's not necessarily needed, but I didn't want my wood to split as I'm adding more and more fasteners over time. Uh, and then I've drilled through the top of this, or that, so there, there are two of them, one on, on the top and one on the bottom to have the solar panel fastened down to it. I don't want the wind to, to take it off. Um, and I also took some paints to get the dimensions of the solar panel to make sure that it would hang over the edges so that it would, wouldn't allow any water directly into it. There's an image of the bolt going through the bottom of the solar panel frame. 
and then through the, uh, the EMT tubing with a washer and a locking nut on the underside. And this is um, it, it, not something that needs to be exact, but I wanted it to be somewhat rigid again so that it wouldn't blow away and could sustain you know, two feet of snow on top of it through the winter, no problem. So these are the connections from the solar panel, depending on what you get. This is a pretty universal type of connector. And or you would connect this up to your system, once you've got your battery connected, you would want to actually block the, the solar panel from seeing any electricity um, so that you, there's no charge going through those cables at all. Again, this is a safety feature, but also to keep your, your equipment from being damaged from a large surge of, of electricity. And they just clip into one another and can be tucked away. There's no metal exposed. It's a nice, safe connector. And now I'm showing the green light on the charge controller. It recognizes once I take that moving blanket off of the solar panel that it is in fact connected up to the charge controller. And here I'm showing, again, this will be dependent on the manufacturer and the type of charge controller you have, but I'm effectively selecting a, a button to allow power to travel from the solar panel or the battery to the load which is indicated at the light bulb on this particular charge controller. So I've set it up to say, all right, go ahead and send some juice down through those wires to power up something that you wish to power up. And here are the ends of those leads. Uh, and I'm going to, to, just for demonstration purposes, here's a light bulb and I've connected it up. The positive lead goes to the tip of that connector on the light bulb and the black connector is going to the sleeve of that connector, positive and negative. And, and I flip the switch on the light bulb and it lights up and illuminates. This is a, a, you know, the basic principles and I'm making sure that I've made all my connections correctly and that power is getting to where I want it to go. Of course, we don't want the light bulb to be the thing that we are powering with this system. We want a pump to be the thing that we are powering with the system. So you can think about this as the heart of the, the, the system. And this, um, I can say more about this later question and answer, uh, but the, I found a, it's a, a supplier called the Electronic Gold Mine. And at the time, these were very inexpensive pumps. I think they were something like $7. Um, and just a 12 volt pump. These are 12 volt solar systems that I'm working with here. Um, very inexpensive pump, very effective pump. And uh, I'll, I'll share with you that there, perhaps as a function of its cost, I, I needed to do a lot of, of work with getting fittings correctly to get it up to a size that was going to be useful for me. Um, and you see, so I'm moving over from one to another and there's all these hose clamps involved. Each of these, it works, but each of these invites a point of failure. So if you can, it'd be good to sidestep something like that at the outset, just another consideration. Um, and then ultimately, I'm trying to get everything to fittings that look like your typical garden hose fitting. Um, so this would be a seasonal um, garden hose thread uh, with a filter inside there, wash it with a filter built in. On the other side, here's the male one. And this makes your system um, interchangeable. It builds in a lot of flexibility. And before connecting this pump up, it's always a good idea to include a fuse, uh, unlike a light bulb that you flip on and off, the pump will be doing a, 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 a different amounts of work. It, it might be pumping more water or less water under greater pressures or less pressures. And at some point, uh, maybe if there's a kink in your line, you'll be asking the pump to do more work than it really is rated for. And rather than destroy your pump, you will just blow a fuse. Um, so add these fuses in, in, adding these fuses in line is a good idea. Um, so here I'm showing the, the system connected and now the pump is all connected up and um, it, it's, it, it's, it, will, it would be powered if I powered up from the charge controller, but we need a switch. And here I'm just adding a switch for demonstration purposes. And if you wanted to switch this manually, um, you, you, could, you could do that, you could do that. Um, so I'm, I was not so interested in doing that. I wanted something automated. Um, and we'll get into the next levels of complexity here. But here, instead of a switch, would be a, a digital timer. And you see on this, there's a, a P for programming, a D for the day, H for hour, M for minute. These are pretty standard on eBay, a 12 volt digital um, 
time controller. And this would allow me to have that pump turn on on a Monday at uh, 7 a.m. And you could program it such. So you're adding in a little bit more complexity. It's it's it, there's something elegant elegant about a, a simple switch on and off. But here now we're we're beginning to automate our system. And here I'm showing it um, just wired up again the basic system uh, with with that timer. And here's how uh, that digital time switch in particular is is controlled. You can find these on eBay. I think they're anywhere from four to five dollars. Uh, again, 12 volt systems. Um, and that's the basic electrical setup. Uh, we'll get into something more detailed, but let's move on to the drip irrigation piece itself. So again, I've get, gotten everything down into your typical garden hose um, fittings and just showing here, you know, there's an input on one side of the pump an outlet on the other that would go off to your field or your garden rows. And I've got this IBC tote up here, this intermediate bulk container, 275 gallons on a pallet. Um, and it's uphill of my pump house. And this is the line that comes from that pump. And this is on the other side, the line that would go out to the gardens and then terminate with that piece that I have in my hand. And uh, right uh, to the uh, top left of my hand are the smaller brown lines leading off from that larger black trunk into that bed of kale there. And these are the actual emitters for the drip irrigation. And there's just another shot of the way that that would be set up. And here's a quick update uh, on what I use now is a more typical um, uh, uh, kind of drip line. That other line had, um, so this is something you want to get into with whatever drip line you, you select is its specifications on how long of a run you'll be able to accomplish um, and how much water you want it to admit. And with that previous system, I was limited to a, a 30 foot bed length, which um, over the years was something I grew out of. And, started to standardize to 50 feet. And when I tried to use that same line, it simply wouldn't reach the entire length of the bed. Um, and here's just another a shot and another quick tip. If you do get something on a reel uh, and you don't have some useful way of benefiting from it being real, if you have a broad fork, you can take a broom handle and stick it through that reel and tie it up to your broad fork. And it there's not a tremendous amount of force to get that thing to spin as you draw your line out. So that ended up working um, pretty well for me. Um, and this line, I just take a quick moment to say it's very easy to use. It's, it's very inexpensive. Um, and these attachments are a little more expensive, but very convenient. You simply cut the line and um, twist these on. And then on the trunk, you would puncture a hole and slip that barb into the hole makes a surprisingly secure connection under pressure. And when you're tugging, when you're weeding and everything else. And this is an image of the trunk itself. A lot of versatility, it'll also come on a spool for you. Much larger in diameter, I opted. Again, depending on how much you need to irrigate, it'll drive the, the design of your system. For me, this, um, this size was just fine. And I was able to, I think it's an inch in diameter and able to find fittings that were three quarters of uh, an inch. Or eight, garden hose um, size line. And these would um, go on to the end of that hose, just compression fitting. And then between my fingers, that piece actually twists and screws and compresses against the hosing line and makes a nice secure fit. And you could add the cap on top to terminate your line. But another benefit is that you could take a female end and continue that line if you had um, if some desire to do so, some need to do so. Now you've got all these lines in your garden and I'm showing you with this image, you know, you've got one pump wired up, but how would you add a second one? If you wanted more than just 50 feet or two different beds to be, to be watered, you would need to start thinking about um, adding other pumps or you can get into something called a manifold and we're going to to uh, the next level of complexity to achieve greater ends with this system. Rather than adding another pump, I'll, I'm, I'm using just that same first pump, but I'm adding this manifold made out of PVC pipe. And on the end of the PVC, you can see there's a, um, 
a solenoid and it screws in and has electrical connections. It's essentially a gate or a valve. And it's normally closed, but when it's under, under charge, when you complete a circuit, the gate will open. So effectively, I'm, I'm able to control the water being pumped out that outlet to one of five gates or all five gates, um, if I so chose, and if the specifications of my drip line would take that based on the pump size I was using. And those are all variables. Um, this is at a scale where trial and error was good enough for me. And um, uh, these pumps are still something I, I use today. Here's a little bit of a closer image, and you're seeing uh, the solenoids off to the right with the electrical connections, and they're simply screwed into some PVC fittings, which are joined to the pump. Now, all of these are controlled by this microcontroller. This is an Arduino microcontroller. There's a whole variety of these out there. There's also generic brands that are out there. The price of these have come down significantly. Uh, you can get a name brand one for um, a reasonable amount of money. Everything on this board is essentially making this one microchip uh, work. It's providing power or setting up for um, different ports for inlets and outlets. Um, and it's it's all running on different currents. By, by running on, I mean, it's taking signals, giving feedback uh, in this language of electrical currents. This is another key component of the system. This is a relay. There are two relays there on that board. And there's some other um, items soldered onto that, that board that make it easier to use. Uh, a lot of different places and terminals to connect up electrical wires and also to connect up wires from the Arduino microcontroller. The microcontroller has the program on it. This is just a, a, a relay is just a, a simple way to um, it's effectively a switch that's controlled by electrical current. So here I have them set up on a little piece of plywood, a bunch of wires leading from the Arduino microcontroller to that relay board, that relay module, and that they supply the power and also the signal. And here below it on the very bottom, I have connected these two red wires, a heavier gauge wire, and I'm breaking a line from, let's say, the pump. And instead of the, the digital timer turning on on a Monday at 7 a.m. and saying, go ahead and pump, it would instead turn on this microcontroller. And the microcontroller would run through its program and decide when it's time to turn on the pump. And when it was time, it would send out a signal to this relay module and effectively flip that switch and start pumping. Now, I've been talking about a 12-volt system. These microcontrollers, they'd like to see less than 12 volts. Uh, I, it was my experience that the, they would actually behave erratically. So even though they had a program on them, they would just start whenever and stop whenever they wanted. It took me some time to discover that it, uh, when the solar power, when the solar uh, system, when the battery would get over 12 volts, it, it would really send things haywire. So I found myself using this uh, inverter, which takes DC current, which is what is coming out of that particular uh, solar system. Uh, and turning it into AC current. But it also has on the front a USB, five volt USB connector right there in the middle. And that's what I was after. Um, I, I'd recommend adding one of these to your system if you did want AC power there. This is only 400 watts, but it was good enough for an old laptop that I had whose battery had long since um, uh, uh, stopped working. So I would have to directly plug it into AC to work. And that's what I used you know, to go out uh, outdoors and just plug directly into this and that was useful. One, um, uh, and this is also another component uh, that drove the design of my pump house. It's important to keep this uh, cool as well. It has a built-in fan. Um, so that's a, a, that fed into the design of my pump house. As an update, rather than using that now, I simply use a, a, a converter. You could find these on eBay or um, I keep saying eBay, I'm just, that's where I got most of this stuff a long time ago. I know there are many options out there. Uh, but this is effectively a converter. It converts 12 volts DC to 5 volts DC. And you just connect it up and um, lead that over to the Arduino microcontroller. And it's, it's a little more simple. Um, back to the original design, um, I've just hung it there in space. Um, was convenient enough and worked just fine. I had my airflow. And 
here's the housing that I built for the microcontroller and the relay board uh, when this was at a very small scale. And uh, nothing fancy, just some PVC pipe and just route my wires through a hole and slide it in there and suspend it in so that water wouldn't directly hit it. And it was good to go. So I'm gonna give you just a, a very brief overview of the program itself. Um, I, I'm not going to try to, to teach this. Uh, uh, I'll instead preface this section by saying, uh, for me, the, the goal in doing this, rather than getting an off-shelf product, was to, to spend some time, but not much time, learning what this world was about, getting a book from the library on the microcontroller, and learning just a little bit about coding to know how to arrange things. But really, the goal was not to become proficient in a computer language, but just to really test the spirit of these open source products and see if, in fact, a complete novice could go to the internet, find someone who had done this, copy and paste, and, and, and do it theirself, which is, in fact, what I did. And um, I maintain that you can, too. Um, so this is just a very brief overview. I, it, this, is, this is not going to answer um, any of your questions. It's just going to generate some questions for you, um, but also give you some exposure into what you'll be dealing with and help you assess your comfort level with, with getting into this space. But there's really three sections to this code. So this is a free software. This is our Arduino. And in this first section, you're essentially giving things names. You're, you're, you're defining them. Um, and it's, it's naming variables, if that makes sense to folks. Um, and it's, it's a lot of getting, getting um, words and concepts into numbers so that the microcontroller can sort of continue to live in its space efficiently. Uh, it likes the language of numbers and, and the use of cards to, to, do, its, to do its work. But um, the, this, this is the first section that is typical for all these types of, um, of, of coding languages, defining variables. And you can see here, um, you'll see these pop up later on, um, this language of delay and delay 5,000. That's, I'm asking you to just wait for five seconds, 5,000 milliseconds. Delay pause is the next one underneath, uh, that's two seconds. And then below that, I'm just naming relays for my own use. Um, and here in this example, I have four, and I'm calling out the pins that I'll be using on the Arduino microcontroller, five, six, seven, and eight. The next piece is of, of the code, the next section, general section, is the setup section. Um, and again, it, it's getting into a level of whenever the Arduino microcontroller sees power and turns on, you're telling it, hey, every time you turn on, I want you to understand that these relays here, they should all be in the off position. So make sure all of these relays are off and make sure the, the, you're setting the pins on your, on your board, the, the microcontroller. Um, you could take inputs, but I want you to be outputs. So I want you to be able to talk to those relays. I need those pins um, to be outputs. So this, this is just sort of setting the stage, this section of the code, the setup section. The final section is the loop. And this is how these microcontrollers work. They'll run through these steps, um, uh, this code in a, in a sequence, um, beginning with the top and going down through the bottom. And to try to bring this to life really quickly, uh, relay number four in this example is a pump. And relay number one is, let's say it's my bed of kale. Or I should say it's, a, it's the solenoid uh, that's in front of the water lines for my bed of kale. So I wanted to start by saying those relays are, are both off. Um, uh, sorry, I'm going to turn those relays on. This is counterintuitive where it says low, but I, I'm going to turn them on. And I'm going to turn them on for the period of delay. So it's calling out those two relays, pump number four, and that solenoid relay number one. And it's going to turn them both on for, in this case, five seconds, um, which is not practical, but just for a test, um, that's what it would have done. And um, uh, the, you see in these chunks, um, it's 
it's repeating uh, relay number four with relay number two. So now it's the same pump, but a different relay. And then the final one here in the sequence, it's just calling out relay number three. Um, so it would go through that sequence and you could, you would change that delay from five seconds to something more meaningful, say 15 minutes, depending on what you've got for drip line. And this is how you would get your microcontroller to effectively control your pump and your solenoids to be watering different garden beds for you um, in sequence. Um, and you can manipulate this in such a way that, you know, if you didn't want all of these beds to be watered, you'd have to think carefully about sequencing things. But uh, with your digital timer, if these were all on for 15 minutes, you would need one, two, three times 15, 45 minutes. But if you set your digital timer to only supply power to your microcontroller for 30 minutes, it would only run through these first two steps. So your, your solenoid uh, for relay one, and solenoid for relay two would be the, the those would be the only ones to open in that duration. So there's some ways to use the digital timer and the, the length that the microcontroller is powered up and operating to to maybe you've got tomatoes and you don't want them to get watered late in the season. You could just make a simple chart change to your timer and rather water than watering for two hours and going through the full program. Those tomatoes are on the end of your program in that last half hour block. And so you're only going to set it to run for an hour and a half. And that's a clever way to sort of get a little bit more out of uh, the way you've set up your system. So I've um, uh, we've mentioned that the slides will be available, but that code in the spirit of the way I started this all, it's also on this Google site that I've set up. So you should feel free to um, access the slides through through NOFA, it's the easiest way to do this. Um, and then you can jump out to this website and just copy and paste that code. Um, but I'd also encourage you, if this is something you're getting into, to uh, just go to the World Wide Web and find other interesting examples um, out there of, of folks doing this. Again, this was some time ago, and I'm sure there's uh, new solutions and um, uh, other <laughs> very interesting ways to approach this. But uh, this is also at the end of the, the presentation. I have more slides here, but I just wanted to leave this section in right after that piece on the code, because I imagine folks will um, want to see some of those bits for themselves. Uh, so we're going to move over to the water source that I use. And in the description, I believe I was talking about rain barrels, thinking that that would be most common for people. And I. Um, at the benefit of a, a well, a shallow well that was detached from the house some time ago, detached before we moved in. Um, and it was pretty, in my estimation, a pretty high quality water source um, and free. <laughs> and um, so I would just drop a, uh, a pump right in there and uh, pump from the well using a car battery and another solar kit. Um, I'm not saying go get this one, but this was from Harbor Freight Tools. And while the charge controller featured here on the top um, didn't last very long, the solar panels themselves uh, are, are still in operation for me, which is nice. Just a quick note on using car batteries. Um, you, um, you wouldn't want to just use a, a car battery for really uh, much time at all. <laughs> You'd want to get something like a, a, a marine battery. Um, or any kind of deep cycle battery. Um, uh, all batteries are not created equal. And a deep cycle battery is designed and manufactured for um, using in, in the way that, that I'm showing things being used here in terms of drawing down a considerable amount of the energy, let's say on a day when there's, the sun isn't shining or a stretch of time when the sun isn't shining, you're gonna draw your battery down uh, significantly. Um, significantly to the battery, but even a 70% use of a car battery might bring it to a point beyond uh, where it's going to be useful. So don't use just a, a basic car battery. There's also, um, you can get uh, solar batteries themselves and um, uh, absorbent glass mat batteries are pretty typical for solar systems. And they're relatively inexpensive. You can find them in big box stores and even Harbor Freight, they have, again, with their solar line, um, if it still exists, I believe it does. Um, it, it could be worthwhile. Um, and there are those solar panels. Um, this is 
all inside a little pump house for an existing pool that was on the property. Um, and they were just right on the ceiling of, of this curious uh, pump house for the pool. And you can see some of the pool plumbing off to the left there. This is a, a, an updated photograph um, just to say that it, in, I, I, instead of leaving that well cover open, it is now and, and has been <laughs> many years ago, would close, I had closed it and uh, took a line directly from the pump inside the well out through existing plumbing. Uh, the, the well water was used to fill the pump by the previous owners. And I just simply snaked the line through that line into this pump house uh, and came through. And um, you can see, you know, I've, I've upgraded the, the battery to a, a very large solar battery, 200 amp hour battery, and a much more robust charge controller here. Um, um, but really, I've just uh, uh, wanted to focus on this piece here. So this, this in the this bottom right or center right, is the line coming from the well. And I've interrupted it um, from connecting to this uh, larger garden hose with something called a backflow preventer. And this is critical if you're going to have any portion of your system um, uh, to, to just obviate the, the potential to, to have water flow backward down this line and into the well. So you can imagine you've got your drip line out there um, and there's uh, maybe, you know, you've, you're using some kind of soil amendment or, or what have you, um, and it picks up um, some variety of, of organisms or microbes. You wouldn't want that getting back into the well and being in your irrigation system. And of course, even more so if this well were to be attached to the house, you'd want to think very carefully about just how things could flow backward through your system. So just wanted to to note that, and, and uh, they're just a small plastic device here. Um, they come in all shapes and sizes. Again, a piece that's readily available, but um, very important to consider and to use on, on a system. From the well, it's, the water is pumped up into that IBC tote, intermediate bulk container. Um, and these are, these are um, you find these on Craigslist every now and again. You, you want to make sure you know where it came from and what was stored in it and has some, some reasonable chain of custody on that. And that can get really tricky. Um, it, it, the, I found a great source. I'm not sure if it's still available. And, uh, it, but recycling centers generally might have these. And this container was used uh, by um, a company that made hummus. And so they, they would buy olive oil in these large containers. Um, so food grade, you want to make sure that you find a food grade container um, and not something that was used to store some kind of a, a chemical. Um, if it's, you know, you wouldn't want any of those residues and they could still be present if they leached into the plastic. You'd want to make sure to steer clear of anything like that. Um, also useful because they can seal this up and then mosquitoes won't get in there. Uh, something that I've always thought to do and have not yet done is either make a cover for this thing or simply paint it so that I wouldn't grow algae inside. And that would, um, um, I'd advise you doing that because it'll save you a lot of maintenance and not having to clean out quite so many screen filters in your lines. Um, but in, in my case here, I'm pumping up onto a hill where this is located and added um, some fittings to get it down to my typical garden hose and a valve so I can um, turn it off and it runs downhill to my pump house, which is very small to see. It's just left of that sedan parked in the driveway there. Um, and it, it gravity fed, it can go quite some distance, no problem. And that was the way I would use my water source and get out to my pump house. And uh, that's the way I still do it. Um, and it works just fine. So that was a, the basic system. And um, now I'm just going to show you a couple images, um, perhaps to gird you from any future that you might um, get into. Um, it's It can get a little unwieldy when you start to scale this up. And uh, notwithstanding, it 
it it works. <laughs> so here you can see I uh, you can see the the manifolds well. I've oriented them differently than I was showing in the earlier photographs, and this allowed me to have ten solenoids together, and there are five connected to um, a pump. There are two pumps in there that you're not able to see very well, but they're mounted to that bottom front panel. And then, of course, that would mean I would need quite a few relays. And they're tucked up inside that much larger white PVC tube housing. So here I've taken that housing off and you can start to get a sense of what's going on underneath there. And here's just a, uh, a close up of the way I've I would set up the ends of the housing with these screw off pieces um, so that I'd be able to um, just easily slide that off and leave the whole apparatus suspended inside the, the unit. Um, just showing you each end here. Um, it's, it was a convenient way to um, be able to expose this thing for any changes that I needed to make without having to worry about adding more stress onto this kind of rat's nest of wires. And even still, you can see I've, I've taken a zip tie and just fastened them all down to that board to try to preserve the connections to all these different relays. Um, because there are a lot of connections here, and it can get a little frustrating when, you know, one out of your ten uh, lines isn't isn't being watered regularly. And so here you see I've got essentially three different banks, uh, uh, two of eight relays and one of four relays, in order to control both pumps and then all ten solenoids. So it takes up a little bit of real estate here. Um, I'm going to move on to um, sizing your the battery that you're going to use. Um, and again, this will be driven by how many beds you want to water. Um, but I thought it'd be useful to get into something more than an overview on some of this language. Um, and a great place to start a foundation is to think about a 60 watt bulb, you know, incandescent bulb. It's, it's on for one hour we would say that that 60 watt bulb is used 60 watt hours. And you might be common with this from your electricity bills, um, but rather than watt hours, it's going to be thousands of watts and kilowatt hours. But this is the, this is the expression that uh, we use and the units we use for talking about electricity and the batteries and the pumps and the solenoids and different loads here. So in this table, I'm, I'm just showing the way that you would think about your system. And in this example, show there are four solenoids in blue. And in column B, we see that, uh, okay, I'm, I'm going to run this for one quarter of an hour. This, this solenoid number one, all my solenoids will run for one quarter of an hour. And, and that'll be in sequence. And that's, so that, that 15 minutes uh, is going to be what this solenoid that's rated for one amp is going to require, and that is 0.25 amp hours. And here are my uh, other items, one through four, and then my pump. My pump is going to run for one hour. It will be running for the entire duration um, in order to make sure that there's 15 minutes on each solenoid. And that pump is a five amp pump. So it itself will be five amp hours. Adding all those items up, you have six amp hours for your system. Now the batteries that I started with in my pump houses were 35 watt hour, I'm sorry, 35 amp hour batteries. And even though they're, they're rated for solar systems, the general guidance, and this will be particular to your manufacturer, but you want to pay attention to what this guidance is. And for those, it was, it, you didn't want to use more than 50% of their capacity, their amp hour rating. And so a 35 amp hour battery has roughly 17 amp hours. So I knew that I wouldn't want to go um, too close to that mark. Uh, again, especially if I'm not recharging that battery to full capacity each day because of weather. If it's a cloudy day for, or a string of cloudy days, I need to bear that in mind. So all of that should drive your, your considerations on how to size your battery. And you'll want to think about that balance point between worst case scenario of a week of, of rain 
and the price point because these batteries are still quite expensive. Um, but th this would be the way to think about adding up all those loads and, and getting that number um, to give you a starting point. So I'm going to just uh, wrap this up with a, a overview of the, the costs and savings. Um, it, and I'll say at the outset that this, again, my, my motivations for doing this were not to find a, um, a, a cost effective way of doing these things necessarily. It was a factor for sure, certainly a finite resource, but there it was also to explore this technology and to, to tinker. Um, it, I, I will say that it, it certainly did. Um, what I'm not including here is the time input <laughs> that all of this took. Um, but it's interesting to, to see nonetheless in terms of some of these hard costs. And so this is a graph of the water consumption uh, for, for our house and, and the gardens. Uh, we moved here in 2013. You can see that's we're setting our baseline of those units of 7,000, 5,000 gallons um, per reading. Uh, we really had uh, a garden to speak of in, in 2014. It was roughly 2,000 square feet. And you can see on the line graph how it spiked. Um, you know, again, the readings are, are taken daily, but um, you, it's clear that there was a large increase that was due to our summertime usage, which is a little lagged because of the billing periods. Um, but again, it returns down to that line for the winter months. And then that next season, we were, of course, still doing what we were doing in our 2000 square foot garden, but now I'm using the, uh, the solar uh, pump system with the drip irrigation, pulling water from the well so we no longer have to draw from the house. So we return to that baseline. And th um, this is, there's a lot of information here on this table. I, I don't expect you to trace through it right now, but the, the summary is down below. Uh, this analysis was showing that based on those costs back then, we avoided about $130 of water use. And we have a septic system here. I didn't add those charges in, but most places, most um, municipalities anyway, um, they were, if you're on sewer, you could think about doubling that cost, um, roughly speaking. Um, so that's, that's what we saved in water that we didn't have to purchase from the town through using the system. And this was a, a good best guess even back then of what were all my costs. And um, the largest was the solar kit itself. And again, um, you know, I, I, I think these costs are probably somewhere along these lines, but the kit included the solar panel itself. Um, what I have on the pump house is a 100 watt solar panel and that charge controller. And then the cables. That's what was included um, in the kit. The next largest item was the drip line itself. And the, the 500 feet is um, not going to be the largest expense. It's going to be the, the all the fitters, I'm sorry, the fittings and emitters and the tools to connect all of this stuff together. But, you know, for that size garden, the 2,000 square feet where we started those years ago, $100 is pretty much where it was from the large box, box store. Um, and I've listed the battery. Um, um, the, the, I'm pretty sure Harbor Freight still sells these. And, you know, it's just like a lot of different realtors, they always have coupons and different mailers. And some of them were for 20, 25% off. Um, and trick is to never walk into that store without one of those coupons. And, um, uh, Anyway, that, that's, you can, you, it's a decent battery. I'm still using the, the battery that I, seven years ago, um, had purchased back then. And then just moving along, the Arduino itself, the relays, the wire, you can see there's, there's some, you know, there's some costs here and they're, they're, they're not nothing, but they're not tremendous either. Um, uh, but the upshot here is that, you know, this is roughly $500 worth of, of materials. And with the cost of water, what they were back then, the cost of water seemed to go faster than the cost of energy or anything else, frankly. 
um, it, they it, it would pay back for itself in in um, four seasons um, is is what I was figuring and I suppose have have realized um, and here's the picture of that same system uh, seven years later still standing and still doing what it needs to do and maybe doing less of what it needed to do this season in particular with all the rain we had but um, that is the presentation and the final slide here again on this deck is again that that website to get out to that google site where you'll find the um, uh, the code listed out uh, and you should help yourselves to that and now i'd like to pass it back over and open things up for questions great thank you very much dave um encourage any uh, participants to feel free to use the chat or unmute yourself if you have uh, any specific questions uh, a couple things that i took away dave from your your presentation um you know i appreciate your um you know i think for a lot of people as they start attending more and more nofa conferences and learning about you know things they want to apply to their yards or their farms or um you know even your your terrace in your apartment um you know the the spirit of, of trying and researching and you know learning for yourself there's a lot of things you know a lot of ideas we might get where you know, I, might, I have to call an expert i have to call a consultant i have to you know find the right person to to do this for me um but i think you know if you have an idea and you have something you want to uh to run with to you know to do some research and go to the library or, or try the internet or talk to your neighbor and and try um and you know maybe you'll realize you do need to call someone if you get in uh, you know uh over your head but um you know i think there's a, a ton of projects that can be done around around the house or the farm that um you 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 can benefit from from knowing how things work and how to do it yourself so i appreciate the uh the diy as you said nature of of your presentation and you know, and there were a lot of layers, you know, irrigation can be, can be simple or can be complex. And, you know, I think we saw the more complex version on, on some of your slides, but, um, you know, that shouldn't, shouldn't deter people from, from um, finding what's appropriate for them. So um, feel free to ask any of your irrigation questions. Um, I found this really fascinating because one of the things that I wanted to do is I want to sort of automate a chicken coop so that the when the chickens come in and I'm not there, it can close the door at sunset and stuff like that. Yeah. And so I was looking at it for the for the code types of stuff that you've done. It was really cool. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. So I uh, I'll just I won't riff on that for too, too long, but um, the first thing I would encourage you to do is just to do a basic search as I'm, I'm almost positive I have seen that and they use an actuator and um, they had some, some careful setup too to make sure that they weren't going to squish anybody. And so <laughs> they had some kind yeah. of sensor to make sure. Right, that, right. That they were, and I, I, I remember seeing this some years back. So it's very likely the case that, you know, somebody is, has made, um, a whole list of instructions ready for you to just copy and paste, uh, which is well, fantastic. I, I was a programmer for my whole career, so and did that sort of thing professionally. So um, oh, this would be a sort of fun way to do some coding type things in a new new environment, um, and that'll be fun. Yeah. So oh, that sounds fantastic. Yeah. You're very welcome. And speaking of chickens, I'll just add that you know. A lot of the irrigation, you know, I I have an automatic waterer that I run to my chickens, and it's the same same kind of fittings and you know pieces that you use from a drip irrigation system that I've diverted off to my chickens. And there's a a waterer that it fills, you know, as they drink it. So, you know, that cuts out my my chicken watering chore for about six months of the year until it until it freezes up. But um, kind of again the same concept of finding a handful of, of fittings that you can convert from hoses to to get out to the coop and um, you know. Uh, another way to, to kind of automate some of your chores.
Dave, uh, do you have a, a source for, you know, I mean, you mentioned some big boxes, but, you know, do you, do you ever find uh, fittings, you know, some of the, the fittings for drip irrigation systems, um, you know, have, have you run into things that you couldn't get at the local hardware store that you've needed to get anywhere else? Do you have any sources for hard to find drip irrigation fittings? I, I don't have a sense of um, um, how difficult any of these were to find, um, but the, the manufacturer that I, I, for one reason or another, did land upon um, this year was Rainflow. And I want to say that they're out of Tennessee, but I, I could be wrong about that. But there, the, it's it was clear that they're at a, at a much bigger, I, I run a, just a micro farm, it's an eighth of an acre. And the kinds of questions I was asking were, it was almost, and the scale that I was buying at, you know, was not $20,000 worth of, of stuff. So it, it was a little, I was very cognizant of that. And I was very appreciative of the time they did give me on some basic questions. Um, but they've got a catalog and if you know what you want, you know, I, I think they're, they'll treat all customers on all sales, you know, at some point, just, just the same, but it's, I didn't detect any kind of online portal. It was a kind of call in um, and place an order. But if, if you are having a difficult time finding some more esoteric fittings or pumps or uh, any of those things, or if you are actually doing this at a scale where you're looking to get a much larger pump than a 12 volt pump, and you know, maybe it's being run off a tractor or uh, some kind of gasoline or diesel engine and you're drum dropping your inlet into a pond, or um, you know that that's that would be a, a pretty okay place to go. And they also have tractor implements for sinking irrigation line into the beds and covering it with plastic. One of these all-in-one kind of things. So they're it's it's very much geared toward again rainflow. I think out of Tennessee is very much geared toward. It's positioned as a large ag supplier. And I think there are things far more local than that too. So you can <laughs> obviate shipping costs and just go, you know, travel out somewhere. I think there's, um, I can't remember the name of one in the Western Mass. I thought I was going to come come to it in that big <laughs> roundabout way about rainflow, but I, I didn't. And maybe others on the on the line know of some of them. <laughs> Great, thank you. I've um, I've used uh, DripWorks which is a company, I used to live in California um, and they're out of California, um, but they have a lot of uh, resources for home, home style, home garden, you know, raised beds as well as large commercial um, scale application as well. Um, and one of the things I learned from them was kind of understanding as you were talking about how, how long a, a bed can be, you know, uh, and still get water, you know, based on your water pressure. Um, and so they've had some simple, simple tests like timing, you know, opening the, the tap off the side of my house, is, which is what I use for my irrigation and, you know, timing how long it takes to fill up a five gallon bucket. And then, you know, there are some calculations based on that to, to kind of scale, you know, know how much water I could use um, in an hour. Um, you know, some simple, just kind of getting a sense of what my, you know, capacity could be and how to scale that to my, to my garden. So they had a lot of free online, um, you know, kind of resources, which I thought were, were pretty good. And that was DripWorks out of California. Great. Yeah. I, I think there, um, the, the one that I started with was called Dig. And in a similar way, they had a little pamphlet that was in the big box store right near their large end cap of fittings and hoses that would take you through the process of, of thinking about how to use it. Um, but the, Hearing you say that is a good maybe stepping off point for me to make just one other comment that might not have been overt in the presentation because I didn't make it overt, but I, I'd encourage people to think about these as different pieces of a system. And a, perhaps a good way to start is to just sit, simply use your home tap. So you, you know the water is going to be good because it's potable water. You know, make sure you have that backflow preventer. And then everything you do after that is just, you know, the piece of the system that doesn't require any electricity. You don't need a pump. And you can first figure out the actual delivery system with your, your irrigation, your, your drip line. And, and um, I think that'd be the best way, sort of the, the least pain, the least cost 
the least of a, a smaller time sink to get started um, to see if this is even something that you really want to run with. Um, and then you could start to think about different water sources. And then you can start to think about different power sources. Um, so I, I, would, I would treat the, the approach here as kind of these blocks of things and start with the, the drip irrigation. And then in that experience, see if you're living the, the fun phrase that folks like to call this often, which is drip irritation. And maybe it's just not for you. Maybe the thing you're trying to achieve is actually just not worth all the sweat and all this funny pipe kinking. And suddenly your four-year-old is crawling through this spiral that you've made of this pipe in your yard. And you'd rather just be, you know, growing your produce or your flowers. And what, what have you got yourself into? Um, I, I would think carefully about the different, the different um, elements to the system and, and biting off a little here and a little there. Um, as a way to approach it. Well, Dave, as you said, um, you know, that's sort of part of my intention is I do have my, my irrigation set up from the house, but, you know, I do have some, some gutters off the side of the house, you know, that I have water that I could be collecting and um, doing more with and, and not having to pump out of my well. Um, so, you know, I, as you presented here, some, some inspiration for me to think about, you know, how to how to take the next step in my own uh, watering needs. You know, as, as, not that it was as relevant this, this summer, but you know, soon enough it, it, it will be. So um, I appreciate you sharing your, um, your ideas and creativity and, and the inspiration that you had and applying you know, to your, your situation and uh, hope that our participants are able to, to um, get some inspiration for their own setups. Um, I am gonna put a link to a, uh, a survey in the chat so if participants have thoughts or feedback about you know, this presentation or, or any others um, or the, the conference in general, uh, please feel free to give us um, feedback and we'll, um, we'll give that consideration. So uh, we do have one more uh, session tomorrow evening, our final keynote, and that will be wrapping up our, our summer conference for this year. So um, I appreciate all the attendees um staying with us throughout the the week and i appreciate you sharing your time this evening dave so unless there's anyone else that has uh thoughts or questions for us we'll 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 sign off here